Edward Brown, host of The Best of Investing, here to remind you to tune in this week on Saturday at 8 p.m. Our guest is going to be Stuart Heath. You're not going to want to miss this show. That's The Best of Investing on Saturday at 8 p.m. Welcome. You're listening to The Best of Investing. I'm your host, Edward Brown. Our phone number is 888-912-1190. Use that number to answer the trivia questions for a five-pack tanning certificate given away during this show. That certificate's not sponsored by the radio station, but by Tan Bella Tanning Salon with two locations in San Francisco and one in Marin. And since we just love baseball, again, today's trivia theme is baseball. Today's special guest is Don Yanone. Uh, the author of America's Dream at a Crossroads. I'm going to read a little bit of uh, uh, Dan's bio here. So, uh, Don, what, I, I've been doing that. <laughs> you know what? Because it's your because your name is Yanon. So I said, Don Yanon. No. <laughs> Sorry about that, Don. Is no, a sorry. highly respected author and expert in economic development and public policy. His new book, America's Dream at a Crossroads, the 2024 presidential election and beyond, is on its way to becoming a bestseller. Don has testified before U.S. Congress and several state legislatures and has spoken widely on economic and public policy issues facing communities, regions, and states. From 2000 to 2016, he provided economic development strategy and policy analysis consulting services to over 100 public and private clients in 32 states and internationally. Currently, he teaches graduate business students at the European-based Transcontinental University. Don has authored five nonfiction books and numerous articles and monographs on economic development and public policy. Hey, Don, welcome to The Best of Investing. Thank you for having me, Edward. Okay, I appreciate you're it. Great, welcome. Um, so, uh, the the 2024 presidential election and beyond. What led you to write this book? A deep concern about where America is today. That's divided, and we we seem to find compromise is the last thing that we want to do in the world. And in addition to that, my many years of experience in economic development and public policy show me that. Communities are suffering right now, despite the fact that some are doing quite well. Uh, and as I look at the state of the American dream across American communities, I, I really have a great concern about that. So combination yeah. of experience and just what I see and I'm sure you see and all of your listeners do. Yeah. And, you know, we, we try to not be too political on the show. You know, we definitely sure. have my view. And then we talk, you know, sure. economics and all that. Uh, and it is interesting how years ago you could be on opposite sides and still have a reasonable debate. And now it's like you can't even invite certain people to your uh, Thanksgiving dinner. It no. seems like that, doesn't it? No. It's sad. It's sad. I, I thought the I thought the last president said he was going to uh, bring the nation together. It doesn't seem to quite happen the way that uh, we were expecting. Let's put it that way. Uh, yeah. Let's see here. And uh, you state in your book that the American dream, uh, should it be defining issue for the presidential election? Why is that? That's because economic and social mobility is just so important to all of us. I think back to when I grew up in the 50s and 60s. And, of course, those were the post-World War II years in the 50s. The American dream was was possible, and yeah. you know we were continuing to advance, and incomes were going up, home ownership, and all these things. If you look at today's world, Edward, and we see you know a lot of young people really, really struggling uh, to buy a new home, yeah. to pay off their college debt, yeah. or even now to find a job. So it's it, it comes down to our ability to be mobile and upwardly mobile, as uh, as we as we've known that to be in the past. That's yeah, my essential. daughter. My daughter's 27, and we were talking uh, literally last night about the fact that how hard it is for uh, young people to, to have that dream of, of owning a home. Um, mm -hmm. You know, obviously, you could you know, always live in a stick somewhere, uh, but yeah. to, to own the kind of home that you want. Um, that's interesting because I, I like listening to Charlie Kirk. I don't know if you know who he is, but he's about 30 years old, goes around to college campuses and basically tells a lot of kids, well, you know, college isn't necessarily for everyone. And you guys are, are not yeah. getting that American dream that your parents had. Um, yeah. And so, you know, I kind of get it. A, a lot of it, I think, has to do with the fact that, like uh, here in California, they make it so hard to build, you know, the costs are going up uh, and, a, and a home builder has to make some kind of a profit. Else, otherwise, he's not going to build. 
I mean, you have the permit right. process, all this other stuff costing so much. It, it It's just it, too much too much demand and not enough supply. All right, we're going to cut to our first commercial break here, and uh, we're talking baseball. Which <laughs> batter hit into the most triple plays in a career? I mean, this is just a wild guess type thing, right? Uh, I, I'll give you the years. Uh, first of all, he hit into four triple plays, 1958, 1964, 1965, and 1967. So he probably was not a fast runner, all right? Uh, call 888-912-1190. First caller with the correct answer wins that tanning certificate. Want to make a quick mention here for Mountain Mike's Pizza and San Rafael. Pizza the way it ought to be. Excellent pizza. Try them out. All right. Stay with us. The best of investing will be right back. Don't touch that dial. Welcome back to the best of investing. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with my special guest, Don Yanone. And uh, Don, let's see if you know the answer to this question. Uh, talking baseball here, which batter hit into the most triple plays in a career? My guess would be Ernie Banks. Uh, although Chicago that fans. would be the right timeline, uh, and I don't know how fast a runner he is. No, Brooks Robinson. Oh, Third gosh. baseman for the Orioles, yeah. Yeah, the, uh, I remember Brooks he's Robinson. Known for, speed, known for his glove and his hitting, but not, not so much his speed. Um, and it's funny because you'd think it would be a catcher, you know. Uh, but anyway. Good uh, point. So we have in the uh, Zoom studio audience here, uh, Don Yanone, uh, who's written some books and a lot of it on public policy. Um, so in your book, your, you, your call to action is to implement major changes in political campaign finance, special interest lobbying, federal spending, and other changes in government. Where do we start? Well, what I would suggest is that we work towards a, a piece of bipartisan legislation that basically reworks the existing federal budget so that we better focus programs from the Small Business Administration, Commerce, um, we look at tax policies in the way in which they affect uh, individuals and businesses, and that we, we basically look at the totality of government itself and how we can begin to recraft what we're already spending on and focus yeah. it on the American dream or social and economic mobility. And I there's, think there's so much, I mean, there's so much waste, you know, yes. the, the, the I, I like to vote for uh, at least one of the major things I like voting for a president who wants to cut the uh, government in half because the government really doesn't produce anything. Right. Me too. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and the thing is, when, a lot of times when I'm talking to people and they don't really quite get it, I say, well, think about this. Why don't we just have everyone work for the government and we'll have one person do all the work? For everyone, <laughs> like I tell, I told people, I said, I said, uh, you know, I can fix the deficit in fifteen minutes. You ready? Or not? Right. I, I, sorry, let me let me get back up. When General Motors was having financial problems, um, I said, you know what? I can fix their problem in literally thirty seconds. Here's the answer: all they have to do is sell one car, sell it for two trillion dollars. But all they have to do is just sell one car. Right? <laughs> you know, so this, I love you know, all this. Yeah. Edward, the um, the federal debt is uh, thirty five and a half trillion dollars. OK. Yeah. And regardless of, of who has been president or the party that that president has been associated with, we've continued to spend more than we have. And so yeah. what's the effect of that? It, it makes us extremely vulnerable. And I think that's one of the things that really signals that, you know, we're moving towards a collapse of our governmental system and we have to be very care careful. I'm a fiscal yep. conservative. I, you know, yep. when I said partisan, bipartisan legislation, that's funded through existing money that we reconfigure, not not more money. Exactly. Yeah, it's a spending problem, not an income problem. Um, yeah, it, you know, it's 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 very frustrating because I you know I understand the the fact that in order to get elected. People have to know who you are, right? You could be the great, you know, Don, mm -hmm. you could be the greatest candidate, but if nobody knows who you are, they're probably not going to vote for you. Well, it takes money to get out in the media and, and canvassing and all that kind of stuff. So where do you get your money from? Well, you get it generally going to be from donors, right? And, right? and the big donors, you know, they want something for it. So it's just kind of this weird yes, political do. machine, right? And you know what? Um, what's really wrong about all that? is that there's so much dark money that basically is buying yeah. uh, political seats and bills in Congress. And you know what? 
that's not the way to do it. That's not a democracy. You know, that's not the best way to exercise our freedom, which are the two leading things that undergird the American dream is freedom and democracy. Well, I just heard um, one of the one of the guys I like to, to watch on TV had a, a chart where uh, I, I guess you'd call it dark money. Uh, I'm not sure if that would be the real term, but basically uh, for political donations, there would be this, this they'd take like an elderly person and the same name was used so many mm -hmm. times. This person would, would have had to donate something ridiculous, like a half a million dollars in two years over like 10,000 different donations of like 50 bucks a piece. I mean, literally it would be like, as fast as they got off the phone to make a donation, they call, they called back to make another donation. And so you, you just know that the person's, and the person goes, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've never donated to anybody, yeah. you know, just. Why well, can't the, super PACs, the super PACs um, operate behind the scenes and there's no limits. So, you know, without naming names, um, you know, there's at least two dozen, two dozen big donors that have donated to the Democrats and to the Republicans that have given over $100 million. Yeah. Each, each. Yeah. Yeah. That's just for this uh, election. I, I mean, even Elon Musk was very open about, he gave what, 44 million or something. And he says he's, yes, he's he not stopping. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I don't, I don't, it's funny because, you know, you wonder, okay, well, you know, what's in it for him? Uh, besides, you know, A, you could say he's altruistic. He just wants, you know, the American uh, dream, the, the, you know, the stay of republic the way we are, um, you know, for, and freedom of speech and all that. And the other part could be, you know, he might be looking at people who are going to help his company. Uh, Space maybe. I mean, again, I'm not accusing Tesla. anything here. <laughs> X, again? Uh, X, X, which was yeah, exactly. Twitter exactly. and Tesla yeah. and SpaceX. <laughs> sure. And it's funny because, you know, a lot of these uh, candidates are not really necessarily going for his electric vehicle type of situation, but, you know, and that's that's where he's got a lot of money uh, stashed. Okay. Uh, here's our second trivia question. Uh, baseball. Who is the only player in history to hit a walk off inside the park grand slam home run? All right. Call 888-912-1190. First caller with the correct answer wins that tanning certificate, which is worth about $100. I want to make a mention here. So uh, I recently went to the Transcendence Theater. Um, they had the Don't Stop Me Now one. Uh, it's like it's like Broadway. It's that good. And that was actually probably the best one I'd ever been to. And I've been to at least six of these. Uh, you got to check them out. It's called bestnightever.org is the website. And it's for the Transcendence Theater. Stay with us. The Best of Investing will be right back. Welcome back to the best of investing one more time. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Don Yanone. All right. Uh, second trivia question. Let's see if you know this one, Don. Uh, who is the only player in history to hit a walk off inside the grant inside the park grand slam? Wow. Pete Rose. Now, uh, it's 1956. So that would have been before Pete Rose's time. That would. Yeah. Why I don't know. Uh, Kurt Flood from uh, the St. Louis Cardinals. Kurt Flood? No, that's, that's that's not a bad guess. Uh, Roberto Clemente, uh, my favorite player, and I didn't even yeah. know that. And you didn't guess your favorite. I didn't player. even know that. My bad. Yeah, yeah I, I would have figured uh, uh, like someone like Willie Mays, maybe. Um, but yeah, Roberto Clemente definitely had speed. I, I love watching old uh, film of him uh, throwing out guys at third base and home. What an arm yeah. that guy had. Forest Field. I, I used to go there when uh -huh. I was a young boy with my dad and my uncle was a police officer and his beat was Forbes Field. So ah. every time we went, we were able to see Roberto and sit, sit right behind him. Ah, great. Yeah, but I didn't I'm know the answer to your trivia question. You didn't know the answer, yeah. I'm, I need I'm to a, study I'm, up. I'm Facebook, <laughs> Facebook friends with his son, so... Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, let's see here. What else we got to question for you? Um, okay. Uh, how do, now this is kind of a big one. How do you feel about the future of America? That is a big question. And I guess I would answer it uh, just about the way that I approach life. You know, I was born an optimist and I felt like if I did my part, that others would help me when I needed that. So I have an optimistic view of things, but I believe that um, America, you know, is on the brink of um, some very, very serious problems if we don't solve them. 
and yeah. they are in part um, financial and economic, but I think many of them really have to do with our inability to work together, to collaborate, to get yeah. um, everybody, you know, working towards the things that are most important. But I, I feel, I still feel that America is the greatest country in the world. Absolutely. And that's how yeah. I grew up. That's, that's been my view, you know, consistently. People will say, well, what about all these other countries that, you know, have excelled and everything? You know, I worked in Korea, Japan, Taiwan, sure. Hong Kong back in the early 1980s. I saw what the Japanese and the Korean miracles were all about. Yeah. They, they did not have, they do not, still don't have the freedom and the democracy yeah. that we have here in America. And, and I like to, to, you know, we always talk about, uh, you know, democracy and, and uh, yeah, I guess there's the democracy that exists, but we are a republic. And, you know, I try to explain to people that I said, you know, um, you, everyone says, yeah, we're, you know, we're the greatest democracy in the world. Well, we're not a democracy because in theory, democracy means majority rules. So if you get 51% of the people who say we should, uh, you know, but just throw something out there, bring back slavery as an example, well, then that would be the rule. But fortunately, we have a republic, and so you have representatives. And, and it's just, it's amazing yeah. when it doesn't get abused by various um, uh, f f government uh, agencies, then mm -hmm. it, it's amazing. It's a really good checks and balances. I mean, mm -hmm. they, the, our founding fathers were absolutely brilliant. It's amazing how much foresight they had, you know. Well, I, I agree with you on that. And uh, one thing that you know, I, I learned because I have a very good friend who's a constitutional scholar. His name is Larry Keller, and he was a colleague of mine for a long time. Larry made me aware one day that the intent of the Constitution was really for the legislature, that is Congress, to be the primary branch of government, not yep. the executive branch, Yeah, which yeah. a lot of people, you know, um, kind of focus on the White House and what goes on there. And it's incredibly important. But that yeah. was the intent of our founding fathers. Yeah, that goes back yeah. to your point well, about the reason we didn't want a king. <laughs> and, you know, they, they, and they talked to you know George Washington said, "Yeah, yeah, listen, I you know eight years is enough for me. I don't want to be king. Yeah, you know, I'm not supposed to be king. So uh, yeah. that's why I I do, do believe that there was a, a divine intervention. You know, uh, um, potency behind these documents. You know, and, and then of course they had to have certain amendments um, to to realize you know you can't get it all in one shot. And you go, wait a minute, I'm right. to think about this and think about this. So that's right. Uh, what, we're going to go to our next commercial break here. Uh, it's a lot of fun talking with you, Don, about this. I like this. Enjoying it myself. Okay. All right. Here's our third. Okay. Third, third trivia question. Who broke up at least 81 no hitters with a home run? And basically, if you think about it, that means he was uh, the, he was a good leadoff man because that's how you break up a, a no hitter like right away. Right. So uh, who who hit 81 um, lead off home runs. Well, I'll, I'll ask it that way. It might be a little bit easier. Uh, <laughs> think about the 1980s and 90s for the most part. All right. Uh, that's our trivia question. Want to make a mention here also for Dr. Wilkinson's Backyard Resort and Mineral Springs voted best natural hot springs in Calistoga by Travel and Leisure Magazine. Go to drwilkinson.com. All right. Stay with us. You're listening to the best of investing. Don't touch that dial. We are going to be right back. Welcome back to The Best of Investing, Edward Brown, along with Don Yanone. All right, our third trivia question. Um, now, I asked it a certain way, and I'll kind of re-ask it a different way. Who broke up at least 81 no-hitters with a home run? And effectively, that meant he was the leadoff hitter, and then he broke up a home, broke up a no-hitter right away by hitting a home run. So who, who, uh, who had it? 81, and I think he's got the record, 81 uh, uh, home runs as a leadoff hitter. Ricky Henderson. Oh my goodness, Ricky Henderson! Yeah, yeah, I would have never guessed that. No, uh, I do want to make a quick mention here before we get started for the Axiom Hotel in San Francisco, located in the heart of Union Square. The Axiom Hotel blends a sense of history <laughs> with modern touches. Guests rave about how the staff and how quiet the hotel is, which is pretty amazing because if it's in downtown Union Square, you think it'd be busy, which it's a busy area, but uh, guests 
talk about how quiet the hotel is. Um, so if you want to go to the downtown uh, heart of San Francisco and Union Square, stay at the AxiomHotels.com. All right. Um, we are in the Zoom studio, as they say, with uh, Don Yanone. And Don, um, now, how are you investing in yourself and others? Wow. I will respond to that um, in two ways. The first way is that um, made quite an investment in my writing career, okay. which has uh, required, um, you know, a lot of investment. Um, Ross Kleinberg has been a, a great resource to me on, okay. as a publicist, um, but also it's just a it's a it's a major investment. You you have to you have to give a lot of books away. You have to do a lot of appearances and all kinds of things. Um, so well, who, let me ask you, who, who, um, who, who invites you to speak? Well, a lot of the, um, invitations that I've had through Ross, who I mentioned earlier have been radio stations, podcasts, other kinds of news media. Um, you know, right. I've been invited to write articles about the book, uh, social media, a lot of engagement on social media. Okay. Um, but, you know, I'm going to begin uh, doing uh, more speeches, more keynotes on this topic oh. as national conferences uh, like our National Economic Development Conference will be in Denver. So, okay. you know, we uh, we provide an opportunity there to communicate about the book and what it means to economic development. But if, cool. if, if real estate professionals want to do that, we can do the same. Yeah. Okay. Um, you, you know, earlier you know, when I was reading uh, your, your bio, um, you had uh, testified before Congress. What, what was yes. uh, that about? Well, I probably have done that. Um, trying to think the last time I did it had to do with the coal mine industry. Oh. And it was some legislation that uh, would have um, widened the, um, the impact zone, an environmental impact zone for, yeah. for surface mining and for underground mining. And so I uh, had to testify there about, you know, the economic impact of that. Uh, but several times, Edward, I uh, actually testified on the automotive industry when, oh, okay. when it was going through major restructuring and really whether, you know, whether they should consider what they did, um, you know, with Chrysler, there was a bailout bill that uh, Lee, Lee Icoca, oh, yeah. and he, you know, they successfully used that yeah. to rebuild. And then, you know, the company yeah. obviously, uh, transformed after that, but those well, are some you know, examples. Well, two thousand eight, you know, during the uh, economic <laughs> crisis, you know, a lot of uh, people think that uh, Congress just bailed out companies, but as it turns out, they were more in most cases they were more of an investor, and they got a great the the government got a great rate of return on their yes. investment. You're yeah. absolutely right. You're yeah, right. it's very interesting because you know a lot of people just oh they just gave money away, and it's like that. Nah, Necessarily, maybe it seemed like that, but behind the scenes, uh, it actually yeah. was a pretty smart investment. By, by, well, by I them. think it is yeah. too. I think I think we need to do when we have to do do it that way, as opposed to yeah. just you know providing a grant that doesn't have any performance. Absolutely, metrics yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I Especially agree. like there's no incentive for them to have better behavior then. No. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and, and again, you know, government isn't there uh, to to work as a as a bank. I mean, we have yeah. a large, you know, complex system uh, in place for for finance, and banks aren't always as friendly as they could be to small sure. businesses and the startups, which well, is why we have seed capital I mean, and other kinds of things that help yeah, there. Uh, yeah. And I can appreciate the idea of FDIC insurance uh, because you have to have some stability where people have to feel like they they can put their money in a place that is you know technically one hundred percent guaranteed you know within the limits you know two hundred fifty a thousand et cetera. Uh, uh, but then again, you can't let the banks abuse that power uh, like apparently you know Silicon right. Valley Bank. Uh, went through, uh, right. and and uh, you know I do a lot of work with Pacific Private Money, raising money for their funds, and okay. and we we act like a bank uh, mm -hmm. where we make short term, uh, primarily bridge loans. Um, yeah. So you know you, you go to the bank, the bank says no for whatever reason, usually speed. But then we'll, yeah. we'll go ahead and provide the financing through private uh, investors, and we can you know give those investors a, a nice 
pretty conservative rate of return uh, with some tax yeah. advantages in most cases. And the borrowers, uh, they do have to pay a higher rate, but yeah. there's no prepayment penalty, so they can pay it off as fast as they can. So it, it's like it's basically it's like bridge financing. You we've know? had so, uh, we've had several of um, those instruments as a part of our um, you know our fidelity retirement package. Yeah. And the and the you, you know you basically come out with a guaranteed seven to eight percent. Exactly. I mean yeah. it's it's a great return. Yeah. So you're and right. It's, you know, if it's not FDIC insured, then it can't be quote guaranteed. But right. Uh, it, but you've been enjoying it for for it sounds like for for quite a while. Um, yeah. You know it's interesting. We we I go to a mortgage or not, I always say mortgage. It's a it's a real estate brokerage meeting once every two months, and there's usually about seventy five people there, and you know we talk about things like rent control, and mm -hmm. you know how. I, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm thinking like, you know, it's like testifying in front of Congress and stuff where the, you know, I think the president even said, yeah, we should have like a mandatory percentage mm -hmm. uh, control. And what's, what's not really thought about is, I mean, if I'm the landlord, mm -hmm. then I'm going to quote demand that insurance can't go up more than 5%. Uh, my plumber can't charge me more than 5%. Util, you know, utilities, what else, right? Good luck. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, but really, why are you penalizing the landlord only? Um, you know, it, it, this isn't like, uh, you know, uh, putting people under railroad tracks and twirling their mustaches like, you know, <laughs> maybe it was in the 1800s. You know, the, the, it just doesn't work that way anymore. Hey, tell you what, we're going to cut to our next commercial break here. Don't touch that dial. The best of investors will be right back with some closing comments. Welcome back to the best of investing. Last time for today, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Don Yanone. Uh, we didn't have a trivia question, but Don, um, how do people get a hold of you and if they wanted to get uh, your book? Great questions. And the answer to how to get a hold of me is to basically go up on my website and I'm going to spell it out. It's donaldyanone.com. So that's D O N A L D I A N N O N E.com. And my book uh, is available on on Amazon, so it's America's Dream at Crossroad. And if you punch in my name, I A N N O N E, you'll find it. Very good. All yeah. right. Uh, so I uh, wanted to kind of get into a little bit of what's going on in the uh, real estate market um, and the lending market, uh, particularly. Um, so I manage a uh, a discounted mortgage fund. So instead of originating notes, uh, one of our funds that we have at Pacific Private Money is called the Southwest Fund. And that fund, we actually buy already existing notes at a discount. So it's a little bit more conservative than the average bear. In fact, our, our fund is really, really conservative because the average loan to value is less than 40% because of where we're buying the notes at and uh, we're unleveraged. So uh, you don't have the risk mm -hmm. of, of debt on that. Uh, and we just pay a flat eight and a half percent and pay it on a monthly basis. And it's kind of interesting. I, I always have to kind of remind myself that for people who qualify income wise, they can get a tax deduction from the standpoint that when we pay the eight and a half percent, if they, if people qualify and you can talk to your uh, CPA about the, um, uh, QBID, Qualified Business Income Deduction, it effectively means that uh, you pay taxes on 80% of the income, not 100%. Now, that was that was the rule that was passed in, I think, 2017. Um, I don't know if that one's going to expire in 2025. You never know. I mean, they, Congress changes rules all the time and taxes well, change all the time. I was going to ask you the same question. If that's part of the package, it may be coming back up uh, in it, a year. It may. It, it very well may be. So that's something to just kind of keep on top of. And, uh, you know, so if you have to pay taxes on all of it, then it's just like a bank CD from that end of it. But potentially there might be some tax advantages. Uh, and a lot of people use the, their IRAs to invest. You know, they figured, mm -hmm. yeah. A conservative eight and a half percent, and if you let it uh, reinvest itself, then you get uh, compounded yield, which is probably close to about you know eight point eight five, something like that. In today's market, that's pretty good for. Yeah, uh, you're talking about part of the portfolio, right? Yeah, Their basically, portfolio. it's like a mutual fund. You yeah, know, it's good. We we have we buy a bunch of notes in there, a bunch of discounted sure. notes. So it's, yeah, so it's uh, we've got that, and then on our freedom fund, uh, we're paying anywhere from eight to over ten percent for people who put in a lot of money, and in that one we actually originate notes. Um, and so we're you know people want to buy a house, uh, don't have time to go to the bank, they'll come to us. 
we'll go ahead and make the loan. They can pay us off at any time without a penalty. And mm -hmm. uh, th th that one, again, depending upon how much money you put in, uh, can yield anywhere from 8 to 11, 11 uh, actually close to 11, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, so, so far, so good. Nobody's ever lost money. So that, that's always a good thing. Well, that's great, because so, that would strike yeah, me as a little bit more risky than the first part that you were talking about, right? Your potentially, but the loans are really short term, though. They're generally no, eleven month true. bridge loans is primarily uh, gotcha. what's in the portfolio. Yeah, they do they do other one they do other loans, but that that's kind of the the main uh, gist of the of this fund is what they're looking yeah. for. Uh, so just check for the audience, check them out at PacificPrivateMoney.com. You can also find our Southwest Fund on there if you're interested. All right, so you ready? Here's our thoughts for the day. And again, uh, Don, thank you for uh, for joining us on the best of investing. Thank you, Edward. Okay, so um, I like deadlines. I like the whooshing sound they make as they fly by <laughs> and uh, uh, work so hard. I like this one. You'll like this one too, Don. Work so hard that one day your signature will be called an autograph. I like that. All right. Tune in next week, audience, to the best of investing. We're going to be giving away more free prizes for answering trivia questions. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm Edward Brown, wishing you the best of investing. So long.